Hi guys, hope you're doing well and uh, want to talk to something about something very important to any leader, business leader of an organization, any type of organization, is the issue of structure. The issue of structure. Now, let me, I like to ask when I'm speaking to groups uh, a misery question because it kind of gets our brain working because we start thinking, I don't want that kind of misery. And here's the misery question for you, then I'll answer it the way that I experienced it. When has a lack of structure affected your performance? When has a lack of structure affected your performance? When, when has it cost you something? I'll give you an example. For so many years, I was a solo practitioner. It was just me doing a lot of things, and I didn't need a lot of organization. I didn't need a lot of systems and operations or planning, really, because, um, you know, I just kinda, it was just kind of me and an assistant. I just did things, and I wrote and spoke and worked with companies and this sort of thing. And then I started hiring people and also uh, coming uh, into independent contractor relationships with people. And all of a sudden, all of this wasn't working. And then people started saying, we're not planning, we're not organized, are we on the same page? And I began to realize, I'm not doing what I'm telling all these billion dollar companies to do, which is to change from, or, from an organism to an organization. Now my whole thing is, I want to be as organic and natural and relational as possible. God's about relationship and so should we be. But God's also about structure. You know, it says in, the, in, 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 in Timothy, it says, God is not the author of confusion. He's a God of peace, which means there's order, right? So it cost me something. And what it cost me was all this sort of like chaos of people saying, What's, where are we doing and what, you know, what does this contract say? What are our roles? And I finally brought people in to help me with that because I'm sort of more of the thinker person and people that are a lot smarter in that area with, than me, and things got a lot better. But it really cost me something in like, you know, there's positive disruption. Well, there's also negative disruption where people feel like, what's going on here? And I had to get a lot of people, I had to get a lot of some tough feedback from people that said, you're not running this company with all these people involved around the country like you need to be. And um, fortunately, I, you know, in my thick head, I repented and thought, and, and I wasn't defensive, and I, and I got the help I needed, and we set the substance up. <clears throat> because the goal was to stay very relational and very, you know, um, high culture, but also to have some good structure um, in the processes because they go together. Don't ever think that, you, you know, that being organic and relational and spontaneous is, a, is antagonistic to structure. You can be an organism and an organization. Everybody can have fun, relate, as well as get a lot of stuff done. Um, so this is what this uh, is going to be about. I'm going to give you some takeaways and all that good stuff. Um, let me give you a key Bible passage here. Uh, you go to the book of Proverbs and you can't get away from structure. Listen to this. Ch chapter, uh, Proverbs chapter 21, verse, verse 5. The plans of the diligent lead to profit. Profit's a good thing. Emotional profit, financial profit, performance profit, market profit. Um, as sure as haste leads to poverty. So if you're diligent and you've got a path or structure, that leads to success is surely like, you know, okay, I'll just be spontaneous, I'll rush it, I'll cut corners here, it leads to poverty. I don't want to be poverty stricken. You don't want to be poverty stricken. Do what the Bible says and learn some structure. So, basically, guys, this kind of understanding of structure is the real time management. You know, I've been to a million time management conferences and I believe in that stuff and I read the books, but, you know, you can talk to a person who doesn't have internal structure and they, their life and the way their brain works will sabotage all their external time management structures. They'll say, I've got an app for, I don't know, weight loss, or an app for my money, or an app for leading my people, but something inside them sabotages them. So I'm not gonna give you all the old, tie, not the old, but the good time management stuff, because this is the underlying how you function and operate. Remember, the, the, this whole institute process is about the internal structure and how that plays out and expresses itself in organizations. So we're gonna talk about what we need as leaders to have internal structure. First, my definition. Um, structure is, Basically, it's the capacity. It's the capacity to direct, to direct one's resources toward a goal over time. In other words, <clears throat> I want to accomplish X. You know, I, I own Acme Staples, and I want it to be going 15% growth per year for five years and to take over North America and France. I'm just making stuff up. And to do that, I've got to direct certain resources, time and people and energy, to, and money, time and people and energy and money, towards that goal over a period of time. 
one year, three years, five years, and that's how we should get there. And structure is the ability to keep on that path, to create that path, to do what that path says, to execute that path, to make like mid-course changes, and that's what we have to do internally. By the way, if you're an owner, if you're a CEO, if you're uh, any, anybody in the C-suite, if you're a pastor, if you're in, whatever your sphere of influence is, that ability has got to be yours. There, you're going to have to worry about that more than anybody. And, and if you're not worried about it, then nobody's worried about it. So you really have to learn this. Here's some things about people that I, I you know, I studied really successful, mega, 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 uber successful people to kind of find out what their secret sauce is. Here's some of the aspects of really successful people that I've learned. One is that people with structure are future oriented. They're future oriented. They don't think about to just today and the problems and worries and challenges of the day. They think, how is what I'm doing now and what is my company doing? How's that going to affect us in a year, three years, five years? I tend, I tend not to go to 10 because of so many variables, you know, man plans, but God laughs. But how is what I'm doing? How's the way I'm spending my money going to affect me? In other words, I play the video. I'm thinking about the future. Secondly, and this is kind of a technical sounding thing, but it'll make sense. People with really good internal structure have autonomous value-based functioning. Autonomous value-based functioning. I'll give you an example of that. I was working with a company where um, everybody was against his idea, the CEO. Everybody was against his idea, but he had vetted it, he thought about it, and um, he wanted to go this direction. I, he wanted to buy a company that nobody wanted him to buy. And I kind of thought he should, but everybody else is bigger than me because I was just the consultant. And so I thought, well, he's got all these smart people around him. And he was one of those people that he, he, he heard everybody out. And he, what, do, what do you have to say? What's your best reason? Everybody was against it, against it, against it. And he said, okay, I agree with all. Do I understand you? And they all on the team went, you understand us. You listen to us. And he went, here's my values and here's our values. And he listed out the values and said, based on these values, we're buying this company. He wasn't afraid of their dis disapproval. He listened to them, and he was really humble. He wasn't afraid of um, them disagreeing. He went back to his core values of what his company was about, and it was a success. See, not, not making decisions because of some ADD impulse or some, I don't want to make, I, I don't want to disappoint people or because I'm afraid, because of values, autonomous, free. That's what structure is. That, I was really impressed at that meeting. Thirdly, they have incremental behaviors toward a long-term goal. In other words, they go, to get here next year, we got to do this tomorrow, and then this, you know, the next day, and then the next day. And it's kind of boring stuff, right? You know, no, it's not really sexy to think, how do I do incremental behaviors? But I'm telling you, God's right when he says, be like the ant, you sluggard. Proverbs 6, it says that she stores in the spring and she reaps in the winter, and that's how she works. She has, says she has no chieftain or captain to tell her what to do. So incremental behaviors are those little steps you do. You've got to break it down. People with structure don't mind breaking it down. People with no structure go, oh, I know we'll get there. The vision's there. Follow the vision. Hey, go for it. Well, hey, go for it is great. We need a hey, go for it. We need smoke and mirrors. But if you want to have somebody saying, now do this and this step, and next week we'll check on this. Nothing happens. So you've got to take the small steps. By the way, by the way, I always have to say this. You don't have to be a detail freak to get this done. Some people have the gift of detail. I don't have it. I respect people that have it. But, you know, look at a guy named Jack Welsh. You know, Neutron Jack came in and knocked out the bottom 10%. He changed everything, and he did a lot of really good things. He was never a detailed guy, but he had great structure. He was autonomous. He worked on his values. He was a future thinker, and he had people around him who had iterative and criminal behaviors. So if you're not good at it, like I'm not good at it, have people that are. What is the value on my stars? There's great values to having structure. One is ownership of the vision. If you have structure, you're the person that on weekends and nights— I mean, you got to be with your family and go to church and work out and play with your kids and, you know, play golf or whatever. But you're also thinking, are we getting closer to the vision? I want to be, I now want to be fully present with my, pre my family. It's very important to me. But there are those times when I think, are we on the way there? Because if you don't own the vision, if you're not thinking about that, nobody else will, like I said. So structure helps you do that. It keeps you in the future while you're still living in the present. I know people live in the present who are in the future. And I love going to parties with people in the present because they have a great time and they whoop, whoop, whoop. They're fun. They don't ever get anything done. And they're kind of some failures, but I like hanging out with them. And then I got people who are nothing but in the future and they got a lot of structure, but they can't be in the present. I don't like to be with them. I like to invest with them because they'll get somewhere, but they're kind of like they can't just hang out and 
have a good time, listen to a great song, have fun, have a great dinner. You want to be both. God made us to be both. In the, in, you know, mindful and present in the present, really future-oriented. Second thing, um, <laughs> structure helps a leader deal with headwinds and diversions. Did you know that your organization is going to have problems? You're going to have problems. You're going to have financial and personnel and marketing and strategic and all. You're going to have problems. And guess what? I believe in problems. You know, if you, you know, here at the Institute, we talk about on the, on, the, on, the, on the character paradigm, we talk about a thing called negative reality. And negative reality means that I embrace negative realities. I eat problems for breakfast. I was working with a guy who said, oh, I don't, we don't have problems in my company. We have opportunities. And I said, so if you had a cardiac surgeon and he came to you and he said, I need to cut into your chest, you'd say, oh, I don't have a heart problem. I have a heart opportunity. And he kind of went, oh, I don't know about that. I said, yeah, that's just, that's just crazy talk. You have problems. Nothing, there's no shame in having problems. You call them opportunities, you never go to surgery. So people with structure, they've already budgeted for problems. Headwinds, they've already budgeted for you know, market changes and people leaving. They've already, they're not surprised by that. They deal with it. Diversions and people coming in with different ideas and complaints. They can handle it. I had a great lunch today with a, a friend of mine. She's a neighbor of mine, and she owns a really great, great restaurant here in Southern California, and we've been really good friends for a long time. And I said, how's things going? She goes, well, I've got a 50-year-old business, three-generation family business, I said, and I love to talk to her about our business with her. I said, how's it going? She says, i got to pay attention to Yelp. I said, what do you mean? She goes, we live and die by Yelp, and up till 48, you know, in, in the year 48, two years ago, we didn't care about Yelp. We're a word of mouth. Yelp matters now. When people move in, they check Yelp. So I'm always asking people to write me. I said, I'll write you a great Yelp. You're a five star for me. But it was a diversion that she had to handle, and then she made it her own. She had structure. She was thinking, how do I help my business? So write my friend a good Yelp. Um, and then directs, our, the directs that we know, you know, as I, as I always tell you, if you want to go scale, you do it on the shoulders of your directs. You know, they are the people that are going to make you successful. It's not how smart you are, how hard you work, it's your directs. And if they're rock stars, you're okay. And if they're not rock stars and you don't relate to them, you got a problem. They need someone to internalize. What does internalize mean? Well, internalize means you take someone in, someone's values in, someone's feelings in. They take your personality in. You know what? Your directs are internalizing you right now as you speak. They're either, when you meet with them, they're either going, yeah, this person's just like preaching at me all day. I'll just, you know, think about sports. Or, oh, they're talking about themselves again. Or they're so chaotic and they don't make any sense. Or they're saying, that's what I want to be when I grow up. I feel led. I feel empowered. I feel challenged. I feel clarity. I feel somebody knows where they're going. They are internalizing you, which is an emotional memory. They're taking you in their emotional memory all the time. Don't you want them to take in somebody who has structure, who says, I'm going this direction. There's headwinds and there's diversions, there's problems, but we're steady Eddie. We're like the ant. We're going this way. And guess what? They become like that unless they've got some deep character problem, which means they probably shouldn't be in your company. But the rest of them go, I, I like that. I've been in organizations before I went out on my own that I was led by people like that. And I was like, I love to spend time with them and say, tell me how you got there. and how, What can I do to help? We're all built to be on teams. God made us in families and teams to think, I want to be part of this movement. You want to be the one that they take in and go, I'll be like him or her when I grow up. So here's some skills to give you, just to give you something to think about, some practical things. First, you got to deal with your internal and external obstacles. Now, what I mean by the internal and external obstacles is, you know, the internal ones are things like your ADD. And I don't mean ADD technically, because ADD technically is something you deal with with therapy and meds. But some of us are so distractible, and we go off on tangents, and it's tactic this, tactic this, tactic this, here's a great idea, and we don't stay steady Eddie. So deal with your fact that you get di divertible and distractible. Also deal with the fact that you can be codependent. You know, one of the biggest problems with structure and a leader is that they get codependent. They rescue everybody, they want to be everybody's mom, everybody's dad, everybody's shrink, everybody's pastor. They can't stay on target because they're healing their whole company. Go give them referrals to great churches and great shrink, shrinks. That's not your job. You're supposed to be there and compassionate. Source them out. That'll, you know, that's an internal obstacles. Another one is fear of conflict. To be afraid that 
I don't want people to, ups, to, you know, to, to not like me. I don't want to disappoint them. So I'll never really rock the boat. You've got to be disruptive. Structure means when people say, I want to do this or this direction, you say, like my friend that said, I'm going to buy the business. I hear you. I get it. But I'm not going there. We're going a different direction. So um, that's the, inter- the e- internal e- e- obstacles. Here's the external obstacles. Are deal with surprises. And what I mean by deal with surprises is budget for them. I, you know, how do you budget for differences in, and you can't budget for Armageddon. Well, I've got a different issue when that happens, but you can deal with market changes, you can deal with competition, you can deal with people leaving. And you know, I've been a big, I've been a big fan of the 20% margin. You know, you gotta have 20% more than you thought you'd have. And you gotta have uh, 20% more time than you thought you'd have. And you gotta budget for like the problems in time and energy and money and people you thought you had. Just put it somewhere. Remember Joseph in the Bible, in, uh, in Genesis, God had him put away seven years of extra food because seven years of bad stuff were coming. So 20% is good, it's kind of my rule of thumb. And oh, the second external obstacle is you've got to deal with culture, which means there are gonna be people that are gonna resist you or not understand you. You've gotta be having these conversations with people all the time that think you're being, you know, I don't know, too rigid maybe, or not listening to them. You gotta say, I'm really listening to you on a culture level. And I sometimes will just say, let me repeat back what you said so you'll see I'm listening. Because the, what they wanna say is, no, you didn't hear me. And we have to finally say, yeah, you do understand me. Then you go, the magic words is, glad you said that I understand you, because I do, and I disagree. I'm not going that way. That's an external optical that you can deal with. Very, very helpful. Um, monitor your derutting triggers. What I mean by that is a lot of times um, it's hard to stay on task because uh, somebody's upset and you think I got to take care of them, or I get discouraged and I hit a, you know, I hit some obstacle. Like there's a report that's not going right, or I've got a problem with the customer, and then I'm kind of like done for the day. You gotta monitor when that happens because you can lose your structure if you find things that really discourage you. So pay attention to things that discourage you and work on them. You know, you gotta be like, you gotta be like a train. You know, a train just come down the track and they're gigantic. And things want that's where a derail comes from, right? And, and, and you know, there's a log that could derail them or an animal or whatever, and they learn to deal with that. I don't know if they run over the animal or they get them out of the way. I don't, I'm not a train guy, but I respect that. And so whatever things, so monitor, what things get me off target? When I look at my last week, what derailed me? Was it a person? Was it my own discouragement? Did I get excited about something else? And start going, I'm gonna think about that and anticipate that. You get in charge of that so things don't derail you. Um, Create relational accountability. Who are you accountable to? Now, you, if you own your own business, maybe you're accountable to the customer, or maybe if you're a partner, you're accountable to your partner, managing partner, or maybe you're accountable to, if you're for profit, I'm sorry, if you're a public, you're accountable to, you know, your stakeholders, your stock, your stockholders, or maybe you're accountable to a board, or the CEO, or the owner, or whatever. But you know, as the great prophet Bob Dylan once said, we all serve somebody, right? So, for yourself, it might not be a person up the org chart from you. This might be somebody you care about that cares about your business. Maybe another business friend that's in another unrelated business and say, would you help me? Like, I just need to tell you once a week for 15 minutes how I'm doing and all that. Like in my TLP team, the Towns Leadership Program, we create relational accountability. Not in a mean way like you're bad and condemned and shamed, but sort of like, call me. What is noticed improves. Just because somebody says, I'll call you tomorrow and see how you're doing with a, a tough talk or with a strategic plan or whatever. It keeps you on target. I can tell you, if people know that on Tuesday at three o'clock they gotta get a report in, if they're any good, they'll start thinking about it a few days ahead of time. If it's sort of like get it when get 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 it in when you can, they're busy. Things are happening. Alligators are biting at them. So create accountability systems for yourself so you can monitor. And then um, define yourself in relationships. Structure really comes from knowing that you trust yourself and that you're okay saying no and that you're not a mean person. And so, you know, one of my exercises I do, especially with or leaders that tend to be either conflict avoidant or codependent, is to every day just disagree, not in a mean way, but I mean, little stuff like, oh, you had a good time in the restaurant? Yeah, I didn't like that restaurant. It was sort of like, what my kind of thing? Or I like what you're saying there, but gosh, Sam, it doesn't make sense to me. 
And if, if you think that's mean, then you're going to have a hard time succeeding. Healthy people go, well, there's a million ideas. That was a, you know, I've had a bunch of bad ideas. And I've got friends that tell me I've got bad ideas. And we're fine. Then I have some really good ones. Well, so if Sam has a, he gets his nose out of joint, you go, Sam's got a problem there because I can take a no. Why can't you take a no? So begin to like define yourself and say, I love this. I want this. I need this. That's positive definition. Or negative definition, I don't like that, that's not where I want to go, that's not what my values are, that's negative definition. You define yourself positively and negatively every single day. And then people listen to that and you find out people kind of like are happy and working and then you start to get more confident. You think, I can do this. So, God has structure, He has a plan, and His plan's going to happen because He's God. I want to be on His team, I don't want to function in my little sphere you know, his fear is the universe. I've got my little tiny sandbox. I want to function the way he does. Lots of fun and love and relationship and this sort of thing. Lots of structure over here. It always wins. All right? So I hope that's helpful. And go, therefore, and structure.